I'm Jill Smith. This is my husband, Richard, who couldn't be here today because he is home on the dairy. Um, we don't get away very often, so one of us usually kind of takes the lead. Um, but both of us came from Big Dairy, and um, actually Richard came from really large dairy because we're taught in the dairy industry that bigger is better. You keep growing or you die. And so you'll see these dairies, you know, here's, here's a dairy with cows on the carousel and many, many, many barns. Um, and my husband went as far as Saudi Arabia actually to learn the latest dairy technology and, and work on a dairy compound. Um, he then went on actually to construct and manage the largest dairy on the West Coast where he was in charge of 50 to 60,000 cows on the facility. Um, so we were really taught that, that bigger is better. And I actually met him on this facility. I was a livestock pharmaceutical rep um, calling on him. I probably wouldn't have met him otherwise because he doesn't leave the dairy, as you can imagine. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, he was a terrible customer. I'm just going to get that out there. I still hold it against him. Um, but I married him anyway. I went ahead and married him. And we actually got to the point where we realized we still had some gypsy soul in us. Um, we, were, we were young enough to take risks within the industry. We were working really hard for somebody else. And we thought, gosh, why don't we try this on our own? So we huddled up around the kitchen counter. And honestly, the kitchen counter has become a fairly scary place in my life because when my husband sits me down at the kitchen counter, it means he has a new idea for us. <laughs> but we sit down and we come back to those same questions every time, um, no matter what we're doing. Will this bankrupt us? Um, is it something that we can rebound from or something that we can move on if it fails? And, and then we decide, you know, can we take this risk? And we did. Uh, he had come to me with the idea of starting a heifer lot. And so we went out and we bought ourselves two truckloads of heifers, these heifer calves. And when I talk about heifer, because that's kind of one of our industry words, that's a young female that has never had a baby. Once she's had a baby, we'll call her a cow on the farm. So that's how we differentiate them. So we went out and bought two truckloads of these babies, and um, we were going to raise them from being a calf up to the point where we bred them, and then we would sell them to other dairies uh, right before they were calving, so they'd get to the dairy calf and then produce milk for the dairymen. The funny part about it is that once we started doing this, we had so many other dairymen come to us and ask us to do this for them as well. So it ended up a custom feeding operation where they told us what they wanted basically when that heifer came home. So we, we fed to those guidelines. We a, artificially inseminated to those guidelines. And that's what this operation turned into. We were eventually feeding approximately 10,000 heifers in our facility. So it, it grew rather rapidly. And I have to tell you, in this period of time, my husband came to me and said, my gosh, this is so easy. If I ever want to dairy again, you need to kick me really, really hard. This is so much easier. I don't have to milk cows every day. I don't get the calls at 2 o'clock in the morning. So just remember that point. Because he brought me right back to this darn kitchen counter, I'm telling you. And he had the idea or had, had decided that he wanted to be back in the dairy business. And we already knew, honestly, this one could break us. It really could because it's a huge step to break out in, into the dairy business as a young farmer. And... Um, and an expensive thing to do. So, you know, we really didn't have to answer those questions necessarily, but we had to decide if this is what we wanted to do and how we could accomplish that goal. So we went out and we developed 700 acres of farm ground that would basically be used for pasture around our dairy, and we were going to dairy organically. So we transitioned a herd of Jersey cows to go ahead and, and be milked organically, um, and send that milk off to a national processor. So that truck would come in and take our milk away. We never saw it again. You know, we lived under the radar and, and kind of just hunkered down on our dairy. And these are my kids here. You can see it's, it's a fairly good-sized dairy. We had a viewing room. We milked about 1,500 cows and then had a herd of young stock as well. 
on the farm, um, and and it was it was fun. And for us at the time, going from conventional to organic, we were we were hitting that gold standard. You know, this was the gold standard in milk at that point, just converting to organic. So there's another term that comes into play here. Um, when we start talking about dairies or heifer feeding operations, we're talking about CAFOs. I don't know how many of you have heard of CAFO dairies or CAFO operations. Um, and it's, it's not always a positive term out in the marketplace. But what a CAFO is is a confined animal feeding operation. And this would typically apply to something, at least in our area, um, that was over 350 cows or so. And that means that you're under special requirements for your nutrient management. The state comes out and watches what you're doing with your waste products. Um, you know, just keeping tabs on you when you fall into those guidelines. So... Um, even though uh, I was the one kicking before, this time I got us in trouble, I had the opportunity to lease a small little dairy that you could milk two cows at a time. And it had a chiller in this room so I could take that milk straight from the cow here, chill it down, and go straight to the bottle and put that in, in the marketplace as a raw milk. And Raw milk has grown. When I started, it was a new concept to the retailers, uh, to consumers. Maybe they'd heard about it, but they hadn't tried it, or um, maybe were a little bit scared of it even, you know, with raw milk. But I, I went ahead, I signed this lease, and then every single day I considered backing out. I had no idea what I had gotten us into. I went into this so completely ignorant about what it takes to actually get milk into a jug. So here I've leased this entire dairy, and I learn, gosh, you have to have special licenses because you're a raw milk producer selling to consumers. Guess what? I have to track down a jug. I have to design a label. I have to do all of these things that I thought in the beginning, you know what, we'll just milk them and they will come. They will come. I have organic, grass-fed milk, raw, that people can't get, why wouldn't they buy it? I mean, seriously, who wouldn't want that milk? But unfortunately, <laughs> that was not the case, even though I'd love to tell you it was. So I set out basically in survival mode, pre-selling this milk idea. I sat down at farmer's markets on Saturdays telling people about this fantastic milk that I didn't have, mind you. And, and you can see that by the bottle. I've got a funny lid that doesn't match the label, and there's no milk in that jug. So um, it, was a t it was tough. It was really tough to try to sell people on this concept without having the milk. The other thing I had to do is I had to go around store by store and ask them to carry this milk, ask them to give me shelf space, which is a valuable commodity in the grocery store. I had a lot of yeses, maybe more noes, but I stuck to my guns because obviously I had a lease payment at this point and we had to keep moving forward. So once I knew that I had milk, I went back around to each and every single one of these stores and the farmer's market as well, and I, I told them, hey, I'm going to be delivering on Tuesday, so I need to know how much you want. And you'd get the hymns and haws and everything there. And, but I realized that if I did not leave that store with an order in hand, they weren't going to call me back, you know. So I had to know how much they were going to take on Tuesday and how much I could bring them before I could leave. So I started delivering this product to the stores, and I literally rolled in after sitting on a little milk crate. I had this chiller. I'd sit on a little milk crate and bottle each and every single jug of milk. And then I'd put it in the crates and I'd go deliver it to the stores myself. Which I think, in all honesty, it broke down a lot of, of walls between myself and the retailer. You know, I came in with that windblown hair, the boots on. They knew I was committed, number one. And number two, they knew I was the real deal. You know, if I'd come in there with the heels and everything else, they probably thought I was just some lady who found a new hobby. But I was the, I was the real deal, and, and I think it took that to drive it home. Um, and to this day, quite honestly, I have maintained relationships with each and every one of those retailers. I talk to them at least once a week about how the milk sales are going. Um, I know them on personal levels and have really tried hard to maintain those relationships. I also take 
every chance I can get to thank them for supporting our milk. I thank any customer I see in the store for their business and for supporting our little dream of a dairy. Anything I can do to take that relationship past that jug of milk, I'll take every opportunity that I get. In a matter of six months, we had outgrown this tiny little facility. And in the meantime, we'd put a little pasteurizer in there because not everybody's a, a raw milk fan, but they liked the organic, all grass-fed. That really hit home with a lot of consumers for us. Um, but my lease was up, and I had to decide whether I was going to commit to this business and keep producing milk that went from directly from the cow to the jug on the farm. And I had to either commit and expand at this point or decide if this was my opportunity to just flat out walk away. You know, the lease was up. Here was my chance to, to run away from this crazy life that we'd created with two children, a large dairy shipping to a national processor, and I'm feeding these heifers for these other dairymen, you know, who are telling me what they want done, what they like, what they don't like with their cows. But we went ahead. Um, this is actually my home, uh, home farm ground. I grew up in Othello, and my husband and I had taken over the farming in, um, in the prior years and transitioned everything to be organic. And we realized we had a barn on one of these properties that maybe we could rehab, you know, and make it a milking parlor. So that's what we did. We made the, the milking parlor on one end and built the processing facility on the other and continued on with our concept of basically controlling this milk from the ground up. We were worried about our soils. We were worried about the cow's feed. Uh, we were worried about the process from the cow to the jug. So we committed. And then somewhere, somehow, the stars aligned along the way that we had the opportunity to actually sell our heifer lot, and we had the opportunity to sell our larger organic dairy and let this become our sole focus. This was our passion, that was clear, but we shouldn't have been able to get out of the operations that we had created, and, and we were. So I think to some degree, maybe we were pushed a little bit this way. And it also meant that we were our own bosses in every sense of the term. And when I say that, I mean that I controlled how every animal was fed on this farm. I controlled how, how they became pregnant. I controlled everything with those cows. And I also was now in control of every last drop of milk that left my farm. It didn't go off to a processor. I handled it, and, and I was in control of how that went out into the marketplace. So we knew, of course, we wanted to have a delicious, nutritious milk. Uh, something that was good for people, good for the environment, uh, just good for the cows, too. The cows are the star of the show. You know, they're, like Pete said, they, they work 24-7. These girls are hard-working women. So, um, you know, we knew the things that could make milk taste different. I think generic things within the dairy industry, such as, you know, the pasteurization, you can play with that. You can pick and choose. You can pick the breed of your cows, and you can, you can work with their diet because their diet really does influence the taste of the milk. But we wanted to take it a step further. For us, that meant having a transparent operation for our customers. If they called and wanted to know where their milk came from, they could come out and visit my dairy. They could meet the cows. They could meet the guy milking the cows. They could do all of those things on my dairy and know exactly where their milk comes from. The other thing we committed to was the animal welfare. That's something that I think we had been committed to for the entire time that we had been within the dairy industry. That never changed for us, but what we could do on this dairy was talk about it, show people about it, and, and let them see for themselves. And, and we took it a, a step further past just organic standards or typical animal welfare standards, and we do things like leave the calves with the cows every chance we can get in the pasture. Winter kind of changes that a little bit for us because it creates some stressors, but throughout the rest of the year, we have our calves out with mamas. They might have six mamas. I'm not entirely sure. You know, it, it takes a village, they say. But we raise some great, healthy animals. And 
it's less stress on everybody involved. The baby isn't stressed. Mama's not stressed. We, we have less sickness as a result. And, um, you know, we have a longer lifespan for our cows. These cows are around forever. Uh, so there's some real advantages to really focusing on the cow and not, not seeing it as a disposable piece of the dairy because they're not. And the cows are our present, but our calves are our future. Everything that we raise now, you know, will, will be our future on the dairy. So we love on them every chance we get. My husband got a little bit extra love this day, uh, which he doesn't mind in the least. Nothing about that bothers him or anyone in my family for that matter. So um, that was kind of fun that I actually got to catch that shot. <laughs> um, so back to the milk, we were producing less milk. Qu or quantity was not our driver here. It was quality. And we knew we'd get less milk, but that was our mission. We were sticking to this mission of a quality premium milk out there. So I think beyond just the animal welfare, one of the things that goes into, there, into that concept is the employee welfare. The more of a family feel we can create on a dairy, uh, the better wages and benefits we can offer our employees. Everything we can do to create that family feel and all of us having fun, because who wants to dairy if it's not fun? So everything we do makes a better product for the consumer, I believe. And speaking of those employees, there are some of them there, um, actually in the processing facility, and Oscar is our delivery driver. So um, we love them to death. But let, let's get back to consumers. This is actually, the consumers are key to our business, and this is, this is just kind of a funny, a challenge that I ran out to my customers on Facebook. You know, Jersey cows especially are known for their really long tongues, and they're built with that long tongue because they're good grazing animals, and they wrap their tongue around that feed. But most people just laugh when they see that tongue up their nose, you know, and my husband is half Jersey because he can do it, so... <laughs> You know, that I, I always found that kind of comical about him. I don't let him do it in public, but, you know. So anyway, I run this challenge out on Facebook, and basically, I dare you to put your picture out there if you can do this. And I thought nobody would respond. I thought the calf picture alone, ah, people will like the calf picture. Everybody likes a calf, right? But that's what I got. <laughs> I had more people sending me pictures with their tongue up their nose than I ever wanted to see. And let me tell you how ugly tongues are, people. They're ugly when they come in a Facebook shot. But again, we're doing everything we can to encourage interaction with the dairy, or excuse me, with the consumer. I want to be your dairy, or I want to be their dairy. You know, they can tell people they know their dairymen. People love the relationship with the farmer from what we found out in the marketplace. Um, but we have this challenge out there of letting people know that products like this exist, actually. See if I'm on, on target there. Um, that's really, it's really a challenge to, to let consumers know that all those details that we work on, all of those things that we focus on, really do make a difference in the milk. Milk is not milk is not milk. You have options within milk. And people are just starting to learn that. Uh, the foodies, the specialty retailers, they're really starting to do their research. And I encourage them to. I love when they, they do that research. But I guess I come back to what does this mean to you guys when we're talking about milk? I think we're all in this to accomplish the same thing. You know, we all want great taste, traceability, a product that keeps customers coming back and asking for more. So I think we do, we focus on the same things there. And I think, in all honesty, that you should be able to expect the same things from your milk that you expect from your coffee. Um, you, w you deserve to know how the animals are treated. You deserve to know how the employees are treated. And you deserve to know where that milk came from, just like you expect with your coffee. So the more time... I think even that I've spent here at this conference, the more I've realized how much we have in common. We are so alike in what we are doing. You know, we both 
struggle with educating our customers. We have the same concerns. And at the end of the day, I think we all celebrate that victory of blowing somebody away with the taste of our product. You know, that's no different for us. I love it when somebody says, our milk tastes like melted ice cream. You know, that, that's a small, it's a victory. It's a victory in the marketplace. So I think working together and really bridging that gap and, and looking at coffee and milk and pairing them, um, I think really will let us make an extraordinary drink in that cup for our consumers. And um, I just wanna thank you all today. This is fantastic for me to get to share kind of our journey and share a little bit about milk. And I look forward to hearing from you guys and learning about your operations. Um, and, and doing everything we can to, to be proud of what we're putting in that cup. And if anyone's around has some extra time, we're just a few hours away, you're welcome to come out to the dairy and, and say hello to the girls yourself. So, thank you guys.